Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ani Pomo. I am a Buddhist nun and the director of uh, Songsan Gampo Buddhist Center of Cleveland. Uh, we are located in a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio uh, called Lakewood, which is a great town. So right now, of course, we are not there because of the pandemic, but we are doing everything online. So uh, we have a bunch of links below. Please check them out. Um, link for our newsletter, link for donations if you want to uh, help us out. Um, a link for the text that we're gonna be using and a link for the um, closing prayers. If you wanna join us in that, then you wanna download that. If you wanna find the book we're using, it's called The Work Words of My Perfect Teacher. And uh, you can find that in the link or anywhere online. Um, sometimes even Half Price Books has it, so uh, check it out. Okay, so what's what happens in these sessions is um, I share the Dharma with you for about half an hour, and then the next half hour, we do some meditations, okay? All right, so let's begin. So the first thing is just to kind of settle yourself uh, get your mind and body, you know, together in the same place, um, which usually it <laughs> isn't. Okay, so just take a couple of breaths. All right, so now we want to uh, develop our bodhicitta motivation. Bodhicitta is the strong yearning to attain enlightenment for our benefit and for the benefit of all sentient beings. So bodhi means awakened or enlightened, and citta means the mind and heart together. Okay, So this <clears throat> desire to attain enlightenment really comes from two things. One is seeing the suffering of others, not just our own, not just our family or our neighbors or our friends, but all, whoever has a consciousness, all beings, okay? And we think about their suffering, like all those people and animals who are affected by these horrible fires in California. Um, everyone who has COVID, you know, unfortunately, the examples are um, quite numerous. So when we think of those things, our hearts kind of, there's a feeling right in your heart that's sort of aching because you really don't want them to suffer. That's compassion, okay? But bodhicitta is more than compassion. Bodhicitta combines compassion with the wisdom that knows the cause of the suffering, which is fundamental ignorance, which then leads to uh, performing um, unvirtuous actions, which then leads to suffering, okay? So therefore, we want to attain enlightenment because ultimately that's the, the best and most efficient way to benefit the maximum amount of beings possible, okay? So in very simple terms, we just want to set up the, the motivation in ourselves to attain enlightenment for others, that the time we spend together today benefits not only ourselves, but all beings. Okay. And then I want to take a moment to uh, turn our minds towards the teachers, our really um, precious lamas, uh, who have attained realization and who took and kept their uh, bodhisattva vow to uh, want to attain enlightenment for all others and to continue to return to a cyclic existence uh, for our benefit. Uh, so we just think of them with a lot of gratitude and respect and ask for their blessings so that we might understand the teachings, which can be challenging sometimes, and also, especially, to put them into practice. Uh, just studying them is 
it's okay, it's better than nothing. But unless we practice the teachings, it's not worth very much. Okay. All right. So as I said, uh, today we are going to be discussing, just bringing up my notes. Today we're going to be uh, discussing uh, of the six paramitas, we're going to be discussing uh, discipline. Uh, sometimes people call it moral discipline because it has to do with, you know, our behavior. Okay. So at everything that I'm talking about in this series of six paramitas. Last week, we did generosity. If you look in the box below, it lists what the six are. And um, this is the text <clears throat> that I'm using. Okay. All right. So in this text, it says, uh, transcendent discipline consists of avoiding negative actions, undertaking positive actions, and bringing benefit to others. So we're going to go through those things uh, one by one this morning, okay? So I'm going to combine <laughs> the negative actions, avoiding negative actions and undertaking positive actions because it's just a kind of a pair of opposites uh, rather than uh, listing 20 things, all right? So uh, there are 10 negative actions and there are corresponding positive actions, okay? Three of body, uh, four of speech, and three of mind, all right? So the uh, pair of uh, regarding to the body is to renounce killing and instead protect the lives of beings, renounce taking what is not given and practice generosity, giving up sexual conduct and instead following, following the rules of discipline, renounce lying and instead tell the truth, give up sowing discord and instead, instead reconcile disputes, abandon harsh words and instead speak pleasantly, put an end to useless chatter and instead recite prayers. Then the three of mind, renounce covetousness and be generous, give up wishing harm on others and cultivate a desire to help them, put an end to wrong views and instead establish in yourself the true and authentic view. So that's the list. Now we'll go th through them one by one. So um, in all of these, there is a, um, a range implied or outwardly spoken of, um, which includes like, for example, to renounce killing. Um, it's really the most important one, okay? And it doesn't mean like just killing human beings, right? It also means killing animals because they are our beings. And when you think about like our vow, or even if we haven't taken the vow, our, um, you know, desire, our goal is to benefit all sentient beings. And that includes animals, okay? So, and also because of, you know, rebirth over and over again, or <clears throat> through since beginningless time, we all have taken rebirth in any of the six realms over and over and over again. And the animal realm is one of those. So if we take, you know, this attitude of wanting to, liberate all beings, wanting to benefit all beings, then we have to really think about our behavior in that regard. And we have to be very mindful, okay? So even in regards to animals, it's not just going out and hunting animals or, uh, you know, around our dog or things like that. It's also like making sure we don't step on insects where possible. Um, and here it says, right, protect the lives of beings. So you, you will see often, and it's not like only Buddhists do this, but you'll see often, you know, if there's a worm or something like that on the sidewalk, um, you know, you, we pick it up and put it somewhere else so it doesn't get killed, okay? Um, it all means to, uh, according to our teachers, to really uh, renounce eating animals and, excuse me, and animal products, okay? So we need to think about that seriously. And we need to not run away or try to avoid 
the truth that by eating meat and other animals and eggs and dairy and so forth, um, we are directly responsible for the suffering of those beings and for their death. So we just have to be like brave and honest and look at the truth of that. And then once we really see that, it's not hard at all to give up eating them. You know, once we realize like, oh, I took this whole, this animal's entire life so that I could have a pleasant taste on my tongue. It's not really even, right? So, and anyway, if we want pleasant taste on our tongue, there's plenty, <laughs> plenty of uh, cruelty-free, you know, food that is delicious, even ice cream and cake and things like that, okay? So the second uh, is renounce taking what is not, what is not given and practicing generosity. So taking what is not given, it's not just that we try to avoid stealing. That's obvious, right? But we also try to avoid like, right, like being a little sneaky and, and just through deception and, um, you know, charm, uh, taking something. Like people who uh, steal, uh, take identities, someone's identity, for example, or businesses who lie about their their product, right? Or, um, you know, an individual person who might uh, really praise someone's um, possession uh, in order to get that person to give it to them, all right? So on an even more kind of subtle level, it includes respecting others' property and and literally not taking something that we don't have the permission to take even if it's a pencil you know like it's different like if it's our spouse or something and we they wouldn't mind if we took their pencil that's fine right but let's say we're in a um in a group or something like that or at the office and um you know someone else has a nice pen and so we just borrow that pen for a minute but we didn't get their permission to do that that's also taking what is not given so as the opposite of that, we want to practice generosity. I don't need to talk about that. You understand that. Uh, so the third one of body is to give up sexual misconduct and instead follow the rules of discipline. So in broad strokes, sexual misconduct is essentially any kind of sexual behavior that is harmful for others. Uh, and that includes, of course, you know, things like adultery, cheating on your spouse or cheating on your partner or what have you. It includes coercing them into having sex when they don't want to. You know, and I'm sure this happens quite a lot, okay? We have to respect their needs uh, regarding our own sexual desire, okay? It does not include uh, um, being gay same-sex relationships, we just don't care, <laughs> okay? It, it's more, it, it, you know, whether it's a, uh, whatever kind of relationship it is, as long as there is respect for the other partner and we're, we're doing everything we can to avoid harming them, then it's proper sexual conduct, okay? Um, okay, so those are the three of body. Then, I noticed like that there's four of speech, right? So speech is a real, oh, we get in just so much trouble with our speech. It's crazy. You know, there's these studies that have been done recently where um, they say like people lie like 60 times a day or something crazy. And sometimes those lies are okay. Like that's what I mean. Like in these 10, it's not never really black and white. You know, if, for example, um, like lying can help someone or if we lie, we won't hurt someone, then it's fine. Right. So the, the typical example given in the teachings is um, let's say you're in the forest, you know, just walking around and you see a deer run by. And then soon after that, the hunter and the dogs come by. Right. Then the hunter has like lost track of the deer. And then 
he asks you, hey, do you know which way that deer went? And you just point in the opposite direction. That's a lie, but you're saving the life of the deer. So it's fine to do that, okay? Or you, you would say somebody who's very fragile um, wants you to tell them everything that's wrong with them. You know, just, you know, better just zip it, okay? But in general, we really try not to uh, lie for our own benefit, okay? Then give up sowing discord and instead reconcile disputes. So this is something that um, people do quite frequently, actually, right? Um, you are, let's say, angry with somebody, and so you get in the middle of them and their friend, you know, or you're jealous, yeah? And you tell one person, oh, why are you hanging out with this person? They said X, Y, Z about you. Then you say to the other person, oh my God, did you hear what this person said about you? So that you split them, right? This is so negative, you know? Again, unless those two, like one of them is really leading the other one down a very wrong path, then it's okay to separate them. Sometimes bosses do this. Uh, they you know, sort of divide and conquer. So this kind of thing, okay? Uh, and, and instead reconcile disputes. So if two people are fighting, then you try to bring them together, okay? If you can, doesn't mean be meddling and this kind of thing, all right? So the third one, uh, abandon harsh words and instead speak pleasantly. Oh my goodness, right? We, uh, uh, you know, insult people, criticize people, um, you know, uh, gossip about them. All that is considered negative speech, harsh words, right? So this is also something that actually happens a lot. But if we don't pay attention, we don't notice it because it's sort of can be just like part of our normal life. You often see this in an office environment, work environment. Um, and I read a study that that sort of this kind of thing is a way of people bonding, but I don't care. Who cares, right? Best is to avoid that. So let's say everyone's in the break room and they're all, um, you know, talking badly about another work member. Oh, she's like this, she's like that, she did this, she did that. And you're there, all right? There's several things that you can do. You don't need to... Um, sort of be like a goody two shoes, you know, and just be like, oh, I'm very pure and I'm not gonna, uh, right? You guys are bad, you know, do that. It's so unskillful, okay? But there are options. One is if you feel like you can't really do anything, just walk away, but not in a huff, you know, just casually walk away. The other thing that you can do, and this just me talking is not really coming from the Buddha, okay? That one thing you can do, another thing you can do is just change the subject. Just break through it and just change the subject, okay? Oh, whatever you talk about, I don't know. I saw this great show on Netflix, you know? Um, have you guys seen it? And then, boop, you're talking about something else, okay? Another thing you can do, which is can be a little more tricky, is to say some positive things about that person, you know? Oh, were you guys talking about Mary? Remember when she bought brownies a couple weeks ago? Wasn't that nice? Or she said something so kind to me the other day, blah, blah, blah. Then it shifts. It shifts the energy, you know? And actually, you can see this for yourself. Um, if you have the habit of gossiping and talking bad about people, um, look at how it feels inside you. There's part of you that's like, you know, like really, why do I know this? Because <laughs> I used to do that all the time. It was crazy, you know, until I, I sort of got into the Dharma and I was like, I got to change this. Okay. Um, so uh, there's part of you that um, finds it very pleasurable. You know, what we use the word juicy, right? Juicy gossip. I guess now the word is tea. I'm going to spill some tea. Okay. There's something mm, delicious, right? But if we look underneath that, especially if we look kind of at our gut or our heart, we feel a little nauseous like this, like it doesn't feel good, you know? So pay attention to that. 
And, you know, also like habits don't change overnight. So it's not like, oh, today we decide we're not going to gossip anymore. And tomorrow, from tomorrow, we never gossip again. It, it's, that's usually kind of a strong habit. But what we can do is make, first make like the determination to speak pleasantly and avoid gossip and harsh speech and things like that. And then pay more attention, right? To what's happening in our life, what's happening in our mind with our speech and so forth. And then what, what usually happens is we have this determination and then like the next minute or the next day, we're just doing what we said we weren't gonna do. That's fine, don't feel too bad, you know? But when you see yourself doing that, then you just say, oh, you know, I said I was going to do this and I didn't do it. I'm going to, next time I'll, I'll do it, you know, and that goes on for a while. You try, you fail, you try, you fail, you try, you fail. Then you get to the point where it's like you, you, you have the thought first and then you're like, I'm not going to say it, but you say it anyway. I'm sure we've all had that experience where like the words are coming out of your mouth and you're sort of like, no, okay, that happens. Please don't worry about it. OK, um, uh, <laughs> so after that, then the thought comes, but you manage not to say it. And after some time, the thought doesn't even arise. So that's kind of the process. So we have to try. And that's with all practice, meditation, trying to be patient, whatever. OK, we have to try. But at the same time, we have to be you know, understanding of ourselves and know, like, I'm just a human being, you know, I'm doing my best and I'll just continue to try rather than like beating ourselves up. Okay. Uh, then the last one, put an end to useless chatter and instead recite prayers. Oh, well, useless chatter. <laughs> Most people find that really hard too. Right. Uh, but here's another example. Like if useless chatter is going to help you bring someone to the Dharma, then use it, you know, uh, although we are not um, evangelical. OK, um, so uh, um, so what is useless chatter? Useless chatter is um, what I just said earlier. Uh, hey, did you see this thing on Netflix? It was really cool. It was really good. Oh, and we all talk about Game of Thrones or whatever. OK, Um it's, it's a little bit like, you know, like I, that's a good example, actually, because before I said, if you want to change the subject, when people are gossiping, then useless chatter is fine. You know, uh, but if we look at our speech, then we notice we really spend a lot of time talking about nothing, you know, or talking negatively about others or you know, criticizing them, even if you're just doing it in your house, stupid, you know, you see something on social media or on TV or whatever, and you're just like, I hate that person. That's the harsh speech, all right? And it's connected with anger and a very negative mind state. So it's important, okay? So we need to kind of pay attention to that. It says here, instead recite prayers. Well, Yes, our formal practice involves reciting prayers like the one we're going to do, the ones we're going to do at the end of this um, session. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, also, mantras. Mantras are a really, really great way to use our speech. And that doesn't have to happen, on, I even reciting prayers if we know them by heart. It doesn't have to happen just on our cushion in a formal uh, thing. We can do that while we're doing the dishes or taking a shower or whatever, okay? Um, okay, so that's doing something really positive with our speech, right? Um, a really good way of working with our speech and understanding it, sort of like where it comes from, is to keep silence, like formally keep silence. Um, in retreat, this is quite easy to do, right? Because it's a specialized kind of situation. But even in daily life, even if we're not going to not say, like, even if we're, we're going to speak, um, we just slow down, not slow down our speech, but slow down our reaction, you know, 
at least that, but really the most helpful is to not speak at all. So um, I read about this guy, he wasn't Buddhist, just an ordinary guy, who um, um, decided to keep silence every Sunday. He would not speak on Sundays from, you know, when he went up, woke up to when he went to sleep. And he said he would do this in every situation, even if he was traveling, um, you know, seeing a neighbor, whatever. But he would carry around a notebook. So he said, like, uh, buying a ticket or dealing with uh, people at the um, airport, he would just write a note, you know, I, I'm keeping silence today. And then he said they were very respectful and cool with it, you know. So if you can do that, I really recommend it. I kept silence in retreat, um, in a group retreat, right? So it's kind of like you do want to talk. Um, and we all used to do that. It's not just me. But I think the longest I went was like four months or something like that. And it's amazing. It's so powerful. You know, you really see like, oh, I want to say this. But because you're not saying it, you get to really think about it. You know, well, what was I going to say? And why did I want to say that? And a lot of times, why we want to say something is so illuminating, right? Oh, I want to say that because I'm jealous. Or, oh, I want to say that because I'm pissed off. Or, oh, I want to say that because um, I want to prove how much I know, you know? Wow, okay. Yeah, right. It also like really calms the mind, really calms kind of our energy. And we don't necessarily notice that, especially if you're just doing it for one day. But oh, no, even if you're doing it for one day, you notice that. That's right. I remember. So uh, you'll, you might not notice it, right? Because you're more focusing on like your mind and kind of what you're saying or what you want to say rather. Um but then when you start speaking again, it feels really agitating. You feel really agitated, like, uh, okay. Um, another thing you can do uh, to help yourself and help others understand is you can make just like a little name tag and put it on your, uh, you know, on your shoulder, whatever, what do you, whatever you call that area on your chest. Um, uh, that says keeping silence or I'm in silence for today or I'm not talking today, okay? Then people don't think you're weird when you don't, well, they think you're weird. Let's be honest, they do think you're weird, but they understand at least what you're doing, okay? And um, sometimes when I started, even in retreat, when I started doing this, I would forget that I was in silence and, uh, but I had that note and, <laughs> and my my friends would go, uh, aren't you supposed to be in silence? And I'm like, oh, I totally forgot. Uh, okay, so the next three are of mind, okay? Renounce covetousness and be generous. So uh, covetousness is this word we normally associate with the Bible, you know, thou shalt not covet, covet thy neighbor's wife. When, by the way, why don't they say also husband? Hmm. Okay. Uh, so covetousness in this case, it's like coveting, you know, we, we want it, we want it, we want it, we want it, okay? Um, I have that weakness for technology, right? When I see someone with like a really good camera, I'm like, I want that. When I see someone with, you know, I don't know, some great computer and this sort of stuff, like, oh, I want that. I want that, I want that, I want that, I want that, all right? That's setting up, even if we don't do anything, even if we don't like take those things, steal those things, buy those things, whatever, we are, it's setting up a mental um, pattern in our mind that is grasping, okay? And that's really something we want to try to avoid. So instead, be generous. So instead of take, 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 we try to give, 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 right? As much as we can. I mean, not to the point where we harm ourselves or our family, but to be more generous. Okay. Then give up wishing harm on others and cultivate a desire to help them. So this is something like all of these things, we might be saying, well, I don't do that. I never do that. What are you talking about? I don't do that. 
But once we start to pay attention, we might see, I mean, maybe you don't do it. I'm not accusing anybody of anything. But um, once we start to try to pay attention to that, we see we actually maybe do that quite a lot, but we don't notice it. Okay. So wishing harm on others is what, you know, um, this, that, like, I hope this person um, really suffers for what they did. Okay. This is very, very common on, on social media. And I'm sure even in our day to day lives, right? Uh, you know, we see something that, um, oh, I see this so much. It's very discouraging. But like, let's say someone abused their child in a really horrific way. It's normal to like, we should feel like that's really wrong. And, you know, um, also, we should have compassion for the child. Also, we should have compassion for the parent, okay? Um, which is another subject I'll talk about on another day. But essentially, why we have compassion for the perpetrator is because um, their action comes out of their own suffering, their own um, dissatisfaction, and it is the cause of a tremendous amount of suffering for them in the future, okay? Having compassion for them doesn't mean that we're saying, oh, it's okay, oh, they shouldn't go to, oh, you know, they had a bad, bad childhood, so what if they burned their children's feet? No, 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 no. It's not saying that. It's just relating to them like through a kind heart, all right? Even if we feel what they did was wrong, they deserve to be in jail, this kind of thing, okay? So what I see on uh, social, that's different than like wishing them harm, okay? So wishing them harm is things like uh, people say, um, oh, that person should have their feet burned and then they should be hung in the square and then everybody should come and hit them with sticks. Like, no, okay? Uh, so that's kind of a big example, but we can do that in regular life, right? Whenever we find ourselves saying, he had it coming, she deserves it, in that sort of tone, that's wishing harm on others. So we just wish that we could help them in the way that I talked about earlier regarding bodhicitta. So if we can help them, then we help them. Uh, uh, and I'm not talking about just the perpetrator here, or just talking ordinary life. Um, uh, if at least we have the desire, right? Sometimes we have the desire and there's nothing we can do, right? But if we can do something, then we try to help them. So the last one is uh, put an end to wrong view and instead, instead establish in yourself the true and authentic view. So um, put an end to wrong views. So wrong views mean like false belief, okay? Particularly a view that will lead one to courses of action that bring more suffering. All right, so we have to be careful with that. Okay, so a few things about what I just said, okay? Um, the teachings say to do whatever positive acts you can, regardless of how insignificant they may seem. Avoid whatever negative acts you can, regardless of how insignificant they may seem. So there's a, a common saying regarding this that says, um, do not take lightly the small misdeeds, believing they can do no harm. Fire can set alight an entire forest. Do not take lightly small good deeds, believing they can hardly help. For drops of water, one by one, in time can fill the ocean. All right. So small misdeeds can be, um, you know, things like uh, yelling at other drivers in your car, like with all your windows up, like not pulling up next to them and yelling at them, but just, you know, whatever your issue is redriving, regarding driving, right? Some people don't like people who drive fast. Some people don't like people who drive slow. Some people, you know, you know the scene. Um, so we can feel like, well, that's really small, you know, I'm not hurting them, okay? Uh, they don't know what I'm saying. They don't know I'm calling them names, right? But perpetrating uh, the habit we have of anger, hatred, and harsh speech. So that kind of habit, 
still creates negative karma, which creates suffering for us in the future. Okay, And the more we talk like that, the more likely we are to actually act on those things. So that can be considered something small. Or like earlier when I said just borrowing someone's pen who isn't close to us um, without their permission. Like that seems like, oh, it's no big deal. No, it, uh, you accumulate enough of those and it becomes something quite negative. Okay. Then small good deeds can be really simple stuff. You know, bringing someone a glass of water, uh, letting someone in front of you in traffic, um, you know, just small stuff like that. Helping others in really small ways, doing positive acts in really small ways. We shouldn't feel like, oh, that doesn't matter. That's not going to really, you know, it's nothing. No, right? Accumulate enough of that and it's really uh, powerful. All right. So regarding all of this, the text says, apply constant mindfulness and vigilance, and you will eventually acquire an unimaginable store of positive acts in the course of your everyday activities, all right? So this is something that I often say too, um, uh, is that, and not just me, I mean the teachings say, <laughs> I remind people of the teachings, okay? Um, is that, uh, where was I? All right. So we have like our form practice, right? Where we're sitting on our cushion, and we're doing something, meditating or doing analytical meditation or whatever. But we shouldn't just leave the teachings there and then go into our daily life as if they were two separate things. Okay. So we want to, right, practice 24 hours a day. All right. And that means watching our mind being careful, uh, you know, trying to correct our mistakes through the day, uh, trying to cultivate love and compassion and bodhicitta, all kinds of stuff like that all day long, all right? We can make even neutral acts into positive acts, according to 37 practices of a bodhisattva, I think, okay? So we have like negative acts, positive acts, and neutral acts. So negative acts, killing, lying, blah, blah, blah. Positive acts, generosity, saving lives, blah, blah, blah. And then neutral things like drinking a glass of water, uh, taking a shower, uh, cooking a meal, you know, um, whatever. Things that are standing up, sitting down, right? Opening a door, closing a door. All those things are neutral. They're neither positive nor negative. However, we can make them positive by doing them with a bodhicitta motivation. Okay, so right now I'm going to drink a little bit of water because I'm quite thirsty. So instead of just drinking it mindlessly, I can think, uh, may this water, you know, sustain me so that I can continue to share the Dharma with others. Or, uh, you know, there's a huge uh, percentage of the world population that doesn't have access to drinkable water. Okay, so... Uh, may everyone have access to drinkable water. I just think that. Or you can think something more abstract, like may everyone be able to drink the nectar of the Dharma. Mmm, nectar. <laughs> oh. Okay. So the next thing is uh, the third of these three things that involve moral discipline is bringing benefit to others. Okay, so uh, for very advanced beings, it means guiding others towards enlightenment. All right, so those, when I say very advanced, I mean people who have attained some level of realization already. And um, so they're really able to guide others in a really um, profound way towards enlightenment. Uh, for beginners like us, it means dedicating your practice for the benefit of all beings, which we're going to do at the end of this session, and training to avoid negative actions and to adopt positive actions, okay? So um, the training for uh, avoiding negative acts, adopting positive acts, really begins with meditation, mindfulness meditation, okay? Um, why? Because if we're going to know what's happening in our mind, we have to be able to uh, 
cultivate awareness, right? Most of us, like, in a day-to-day -day situation, we're just acting automatically, you know, the stimulus response, stimulus response, stimulus response. And we don't really even consider that we could uh, change our habits, right? That we could work with our mind to develop all the qualities that not just Buddhism, but all other faiths um, and, you know, secular humanists as well uh, aspire to kindness, generosity, um, love, compassion, patience, all that stuff. Uh, we don't need to feel like, well, you know, I'm an angry person or whatever. Like we can work with the mind. It's very workable. It's very doable through training, okay? So the more we do this, uh, the meditation that we're going to do today, which is mindfulness and breathing, the more that we do that, um, so I, I'm gonna explain it just a little bit and then we're gonna do it, okay? Um, so we take the posture, which I'll explain. Then we focus on the sensation of the breath. We can use anything, but this is what was taught by the Buddha um, the first time because the breath is always with us. I mean, hopefully, right? Un until we're dead. So um, just focus on that sensation. And then what we're doing with the mind is we're just letting the thoughts arise, dwell, and disappear, okay? Arise, dwell, and disappear without engaging in them. So a thought arises, um, beautiful day today, and we just let that dwell however long it will. It will disappear. Another thought will take its place. Uh, um, you know, I should writing and then whatever I like lemon cookies you know whatever okay but we don't interact and why we don't engage with them so what I mean by engage with them is thought arises um, it's a beautiful day today is followed by you know I should go for a bike ride and then we're just off and running you know but it's pink. I don't like the color pink. What am I going to do? You know, oh my goodness. I remember my first bike was baby blue when I was 12 and my dad was like this. And I remember, you know, brum, 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 brum. okay, that's engaging. So we just try to avoid that. However, as beginners, that's going to happen. Okay. Definitely going to happen. All right. But as soon as we realize that's happening, just we bring our mind back to the breath. So how does that help anything in regards to everything that we just talked about, okay? It helps by us sort of two main things. One is that we are able to, to like separate out our ourselves from our thoughts and emotions. Like normally we're just together like that, you know, we very strongly identify with our thoughts and emotions. So this helps us to realize that we are not our thoughts and emotions, that they're just clouds passing through the sky. And that practice then helps us like when we're angry, let's say, to realize that that anger is not you, you know? It's a thought, an emotion, just passing through the mind. So when we learn that, we can, we can just, you know, we don't, like it's easier not to act on it, right? Because we know through a lot of practice that all these thoughts and emotions passing through the mind are impermanent. They don't have a substance. You know, anger is not a samurai uh, standing behind you, uh, um, uh, you know, ready to cut off your head. Okay. Anger is just, it's nothing really, right? So, um, and, and I did a whole thing on anger uh, video earlier. So you can have a look at that. Um, I see someone has a question. I'll be with you in one second. Um, um, so meditation helps with that. And uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, it helps us to know and know more quickly what's happening in the mind. Okay. So that we can 
change it when it's small. And again, taking anger as an example, anger doesn't begin with rage. Okay, it doesn't start there, or even though we might feel that way. If we're aware and we cultivate this awareness about what's happening in the mind, then uh, we see anger when it's just this little sprout, right? It's just a little, little thing that is irritation. If we see that, it's so easy to work with. But if we're already in a rage, you know, we're just out of control. So this is another way that meditation helps. I'm really talking much longer than I usually do, but let's see this question. Where is the fine line in accepting the thoughts and letting go? I guess I always get confused and think that letting go of the train of thought is equal to rejecting them. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. I was just going to talk about that, but I was like, we're out of time. Okay. Um, so in the West, typically we're given two choices, right, regarding emotions, okay? And again, I, I'm just going to talk about anger because we're on that subject. Um, in the West, we say either we act on it, so we go and punch somebody in the face or we insult them or we write them an angry email or whatever it is, or we repress it, we push it down. Uh and if we're pushing things down, just like modern psychology will tell you, that's going to cause a problem. That's going to make you sick. It's going to come out in some other way. Uh, you might get depressed because you're just holding it all in. Okay. But Buddhism poses a third option, which is neither uh, acting it out nor rejecting it or pushing it down. And that is to fully experience that emotion and then let it go. But that letting go is not pushing it away. That letting go comes from experiencing that emotion. So if you're talking about anger, for example, just when you feel angry, I mean, if possible, not like if you're driving, you don't have to pull over, but let's say you feel really angry, right? So what you, what you want to do is just sit down, close your eyes, let go of the storyline. The storyline is I feel angry because this person did this and this, because that's going to feed the anger. So just drop the storyline, doesn't matter, and look at the experience of that. We, we all know we don't want to be angry, right? But uh, we, we don't normally fully experience it. So once you fully experience it, and that means looking at how does it feel in the body, it's so painful. It's so uncomfortable. How does it feel in the mind? Equally painful and uncomfortable. So once we see that it is actually painful to us, that it's causing us to suffer, it's much easier to let it go. And we just let it go. And we, and it goes on from there. Okay, so that's the, um, and I hope that answered your question, Edward. All right, so we don't have much time, so we're just going to do mindfulness of breathing practice now, okay? And I explained most of it. I'm just going to talk about the posture for a second, and then we will do it. So the main thing is, uh, if you're sitting in a chair, put your feet flat on the floor. Don't cross your legs, okay? If you're sitting on the floor, just sit cross-legged in whatever way is most comfortable for you. The rest of the instructions are exactly the same. So uh, you can put your hands, palms down on your knees, uh, palms up in your lap, or, or like this, you know, where you're sort of holding a goose egg. Um, arms are relaxed. Back is straight. That's the most important thing. You really need to have a straight back. Straight, but relaxed. So you don't want to be like you're in the army, okay? Just straight. Back of the neck is also straight. Chin is going to be tucked in a little bit because of that. So you're not sitting like this. You're not sitting like this, okay? You just... Mouth is closed but relaxed, tongue resting on the roof of the mouth, breathing through the nose. Eyes ideally should be open in this case, okay, but looking down about halfway. So if you look straight ahead and then you just lower your eyes like halfway, that's a good relaxed gaze. Then you bring your awareness to the sensation of the breath, end of your nose. Then you just let the thoughts come and go like clouds in the sky. If you get distracted by jumping into the storyline or whatever, as soon as you realize that, just bring the mind back to the breath. That's it. All right. Now ring the gong to start and also to finish.
Now you can begin to count the breaths, counting either every inhalation or every exhalation, up to a total of 10 breaths. The counting helps us to realize more quickly if we've gotten distracted. So uh, please begin that now if you like. When you lose count, just come back, start again at one. When you beyond 10, start again at one. So now we are going to do the closing prayers. You can join us if you like or not, as you wish. First, we're going to begin with the long life prayers for the Dalai Lama and our teachers. These we do just in Tibetan, but the English is there, so of course you can read it yourself. Kanri wawe kowe shinkan su pentan de wa malu juene chenre ziyon den zing yam so yi shape ke kapa tu tank on swasti jing me rajam se ye chen la ki ken se de karun se nutan chok subsum yishi to je ta tan chin Tendra man pejrine ta shin sho. Om swasti tse la kyam se chen lav ten ju ne. Nun sin tak se yu chu pen ma wong. Sang sun na dre kya po ta ten ne. Lav chen ten de si ten ta ke sho. 
Nama Kungkam Sangpo Suwade, Chutu Good Saving Wasuwade, Trine Tashin Gepa Suwade, Lama Dandre Wame Pachingi Lo. Excuse me. So the next page, uh, this first prayer here we say once in English and once in Tibetan. The next three we say just in English and then we say the hundred syllable mantra. So I want to explain this prayer because I did talk about um, dedicating the merit earlier uh, as a virtuous act. So this is what we, we're doing. So merit is essentially like... Um, you know, like good karma, let's say, the sort of uh, really positive um, thing. So we consider that studying the Dharma, practice the, practicing the Dharma, and any kind of virtuous act we do creates this merit. May all attain omniscience. So omniscience in this case is synonym for full uh, enlightenment, full Buddhahood. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing. So this has directly to do with the law of cause and effect, otherwise known as karma. So with the understanding that it's like our own negative acts that really cause us to suffer, okay? From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, these are considered the four main streams of suffering. Um, old age, sickness, and death, really easy to understand how that is suffering, but birth is, is like normally in the West, birth is considered something really positive, something really to be celebrated. And of course, in a way it is, you know, typically or... Not to, I don't know if it's typically, but often it makes the parents very happy. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but it's considered a stream of suffering because it's typically very painful for the mother and very painful also for the baby and um, really life-threatening for both of them. So that's one thing. And then, you know, if we are have taken birth, then we're still in cyclic existence or samsara. From the ocean of cyclic existence, may I free all beings. So cyclic existence is this round of birth and death and birth and death and birth and death over and over in all these different forms that um, we have been circling since beginningless time and it is essentially suffering. Uh, ocean because it's very vast, very vast and very deep. May I free all beings? So that's again bodhicitta, the wish to free others from suffering and the cause of suffering. Okay, so let's start here. By this merit, may all attain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of cyclic existence. May I free all beings. So nan di tam che sik pa ni to me ni pe dra nan pam che shin ke ga na chi ba lon tru pa yi si pe so le dro wa dro wa sho. May Bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be. And where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may it too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. Ever absorbed in the display of divine forms and primordial awareness, appearance, sound, and perception in the state of divinities, mantras, and dharmakaya, may I, inseparable from the practice of the profound and secret great yoga, attain within the essence of mind the state of one taste. Om Vajra Sattva Samaya Manupalaya Vajra Sattva Tenopa Tishta Dritto Me Bhava Sutto Kayo Me Bhava Supo Kayo Me Bhava Anuratto Me Bhava Sarva Siddhi Me Prayatsa Sarva Kama Sutsa Me Chitam Shri Yang Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagavan Sawatatagata Vajrama Me Munsa Vajri Bhava Mahasamaya Sattva Okay, so now uh, there's going to be some time for uh, questions.
answer. Um, but as I always say, I really don't wait very long. So if you have a question, now's your chance. Okay, I don't see any questions. So, uh, so we're gonna um, close out here. Um, but before we do, I just want to remind you that there's a bunch of links below in the description. Um, so, uh, you know, please look there. Um, and I also want to really encourage you to sign up for the newsletter if you haven't already, because that is the best way to be totally up to date on uh, everything that we're doing. Uh, and again, everything is online, so you don't have to think about traveling or anything like that. Um, every Sunday this happens, except the, I mean, every Sunday there's, you know, guided meditation like we're doing right now, except the last Sunday of the month, which is family meditation, and that is via Zoom. So for that, uh, really look in the newsletter or better yet, look on our website. Uh, and, you know, you need to register for that, but no fee, obviously there's no fee for this. Um, if you're able to make a donation, we so appreciate it. Uh, we still have to pay rent, utilities, uh, insurance, and so forth. And there's other costs involved, even though we're not physically at the center. So please think about that, even if it's just a little bit. Um, oh, yeah. So then uh, we're also going to be doing practicing the Buddha sadhana together um, via Zoom. Uh, hopefully every single Buddha day, um, uh, that will be on the website also. Um, and it's just half an hour right now. It's five to five thirty PM. So hopefully everyone's welcome. Oh, no, this is not a question. Okay. So again, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Um, I enjoyed doing this with you. I hope it was helpful and uh, I hope to see you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.